It's time for our Tom Hartman University Book Club. With us, the the uh, author of The American Revolution of 1800, Dan Sisson. Uh, it says here, Distinguished Professor of American History and the Revolution Coming Our Way at the Tom Hartman University on the Banks of the Potomac. I love that, Dan. Adjunct fac- faculty member, of course, at East, uh, Eastern Washington University, where he teaches the history of technology in the engineering department. Uh, but uh, most significantly, the author of this brilliant book, The American Revolution of 1800. Dan, welcome back. We're up to more or less, uh, what, chapter three in the book here now, That's right? That's right. Okay. And chapter three, as I recall, heavily uh, discusses conspiracy. Um, what, is, what, is, what is this idea of conspiracy that was such a big deal to the founders of this country? Well, I think it's something that's now in our national character, and it stems from the very beginning. Uh, If you go back into our colonial history, what you find out is that there was this real suspicion of the ministry in Great Britain that they weren't acting in the interest of the colonies, and we really weren't a part of the British Empire. They were just exploiting us. And if you look at, say, like Governor Bernard of Massachusetts, you know what he was always complaining about were these conspirators in England. And then if you look at our revolution, we were fighting the British, and so we were always assuming that they were going to try to destroy our revolution. And after the revolution, there was a whole period in which we were upset about the people who had been loyal to Great Britain who were still in our country, but had been sort of their influences were minimized, and, uh, but we were suspicious of them. And then, of course, we get into the whole classical tradition which was their tradition in the 18th century, Um, not necessarily ours, but that's the way they looked at the world. And they always saw the ghost of Caesar, you know, threatening to overturn a republic and use the army to enforce it. And so that Americans from the very beginning were sort of suspicious of military power, uh, especially the Order of Cincinnati. At one point, the uh, militarist in America had made a proposal to Washington so that he could become the king. And Washington made a huge ceremony at Annapolis to turn it down, gave his sword to the civilian authority. But ever since then, they were... This was after the Revolutionary War and before the, the ratification yeah. of the Constitution. That's right. Right. And, uh, and Washington was very uh, aware of the symbolic nature of that. And what he was trying to do was to put to rest all of these uh, thoughts about conspiracy that existed that uh, there were rich people who were going to combine with the military and take over the country. Yeah. And if that sounds familiar, then, I mean, history's repeating itself. Yeah, yeah, I think so. One of, one of, one of my most uh, fascinating reads over the years, back, back in, in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, when I was reading Jefferson's collected works, mm-hmm. were his diaries and comments uh, correct me if I'm, I might be misremembering, it might have been somebody else or something else, but I don't think so, about the XYZ affair and how John Adams was ginning this thing up. And, uh, you know, that the, the, there was just this general sense, uh, the XYZ affair uh, being... Oh, I, you're absolutely right about this. Uh, there's no, no um, question about it. In fact, what was taking place here was that the British were trying to insinuate themselves into the the ruling the ruling ship of America. Remember Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of Treasury. Uh, he was uh, almost a British agent. I mean, um, we find out you know years later that Hamilton was giving all these secrets to the British, and Hamilton had patterned his administration of government on the model of Walpole, who was the minister in England 20, 30 years before that, in which the idea was to use money to buy the votes of legislators, to use money to get control of the both branches of government, the executive and legislative, by corrupting the legislature. And so when the XYZ affair comes along uh, in Adams' administration and, and uh, we find out that they're, 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 there's a good possibility that uh, we're going to ally ourselves with Great Britain, and people are just frightened to death of this, especially right. Jefferson. He hated the British. Yeah. Yeah, and and the X Y Z affair. Uh, uh, you want to recap it real quickly so people know what we're talking about here? Well, this is a, an attempt to uh, send an emissary to uh, Great Britain to make a treaty, and um, he is uh, made fun of and and criticized in the press, and the people uh, who are the conservatives, you know, are up in arms about this as well as Jefferson because they are afraid 
that this minister is going to uh, give up American interests, yeah. you know, to Great Britain. Yeah. And there was also the there was Mr. X, Mr. Y, Mr. Z, the, or maybe I'm conflating two different things where where uh, I think John Jay was part of this uh, group of, of uh, three people That's who right. went over to France and a guy yep. came up and uh, presented himself to them saying that he he had influence with the French government and he could make things happen and he just needed to have his palms greased. And uh, was that the XYZ affair, or am I thinking of something else? No, I, I, you're right about that. But the, the, the thing is that in terms of foreign relations, we were trying to maintain our independence, and we were afraid. Uh, we had a kind of a quasi-war going on because the French were intercepting our uh, shipping, and the, so were the British, and they were impressing seamen. And we were thinking that, you know, th this can't go on. We can't right. just ignore it. And so we were we were walking a tightrope, really, between Britain and France in terms of our independence. So with and, Walpole, the, the the British minister, and and Alexander Hamilton, uh, George Washington's secretary of the Treasury, and ultimately the guy that Thomas Jefferson's vice president Aaron Burr shot and killed. That's right. Um, that that uh, with Alexander Hamilton and Walpole both promoting this idea that really we should have the appearance of democracy but the reality of of uh, aristocracy or plutocracy um that that really a, a small governing elite was necessary that as jo as john adams used to refer to average people the rabble you know that the rabble can't be right. trusted the rabble are dangerous That's um, right. and therefore let's use money to buy legislators um as a as an actual strategy how is that different from what's going on right now with billionaires buying our legislators in this last election we have a little less than a minute before the break, Dan. Yeah, it doesn't uh, doesn't differ at all. And uh, when um, the, the Citizens United was passed, it just unleashed this huge flood of money into our electoral system as well as our legislative uh, debates. And what we see now is the major influence. I mean, uh, Walpole was gone from the scene by the time Hamilton became the major influence in Washington's administration. But Hamilton... Uh, was called the Walpole of America, and he took that cue. I mean, this was his great ambition and and uh, reputation was his ability to manipulate, to establish the Bank of the United States, like Walpole established the Bank of England, to allow the bankers and the financiers unbelievable influence in the system. Yeah, so it, it's it's amazing. It's it's almost you wonder if, if David Koch is the reincarnation of Walpole and his brother is the reincarnation <laughs> of Hamilton. I mean, it's I just more like Hamilton. You're yeah, right it's amazing. We're talking with Dan Sisson, who is the author of the book, The American Revolution of 1800, distinguished professor of American history here at the Tom Hartman University. He also teaches at Eastern Western Uni at Washington University. This is the Tom Hartman program. And you can find the book at your favorite bookstore or online source. It's everywhere. In fact, it's uh, number six in uh, elections, uh, number six bestseller over at Amazon. And welcome back, Dan Sisson, with us uh, for this half hour, this uh, first half hour of this program, or of this of this hour. And Dan, so so pleased to have you with us. And a tip of the hat to the great folks at uh, Eastern Washington University who are facilitating your your uh, presence with us. Thank you for that. Yeah, um, I agree with that. Yeah, good good folks. How was uh, conspiracy recognized by our founders? I, you know, I I asked generally before, what about conspiracy? What and and what are the parallels to today beyond the things that we just discussed, or or have we just discussed that? Well, not really, because uh, when we talk about conspiracy as a phenomenon, you you always look at the character of an individual. In the 18th century, the character was everything. We don't talk about that as much today as they did, and they were concerned about principles. And so, if a person was overly ambitious, if a person was willing to cut corners or say things that they knew were wrong, uh, but they could get political mileage out of it, um, they would be looked upon with suspicion. And I don't think there's any person who fits that bill more than, say, Alexander Hamilton, um, who was, remember, the chief general who had been appointed by Washington at one point during the Whiskey Rebellion, he was at the head of 13,000 men, and Washington retired from the field. And so there was this fear that America was going to adopt a big standing army 
at that time, which was unnecessary, and that they would, the people like Hamilton would use that army to overwhelm the civilian institutions. So naturally, there was this idea that this individual with his uh, ambitions would conspire to gradually overthrow the system. Uh, if you read, you, I mean, you've read most of Jefferson's works, and you've run across, I'm sure, several uh, references to Hamilton at times when he's praising Caesar as his uh, the most and greatest man in history. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, you know, he's also uh, saying that the British Constitution is the greatest constitution in the world and it surpasses the American Constitution. And several times he confides with people that all we have to do is just move the American system closer to the British and, and we'll have a much better system. So it's, the, it's, it's a guy who's willing to use political influence to basically undermine the principles of the republic that Madison and Jefferson so feared. Yeah. And so conspiracy in their mind is something that um, can happen. It's always present. It's always possible. It's almost like a permanent state of mind that um, you might say paranoia mm -hmm. in America. Yeah, although it had some justification. I mean, it, totally. it, it, was it not Hamilton who at the Constitutional Convention stood up and said that the president should be elected for life and got, you know, basically laughed out of there, went back to New York, so PO'd that he... he yeah. Stood, yeah. And, he, and he only attended a few more times. Yeah. But what he did was to give a speech which monitor, or gave a mirror of the British Constitution. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it's, it's really quite remarkable how... how Similar, you know, William F. Buckley used to be upfront about this kind of stuff, you know, that he we did. should have a governing elite. He was an honest conservative. It's yep. amazing to me how now the, 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 these, the, the Stolf conservatives, the Hamiltonians, shall we call them, cloak their, their, uh, and Hamilton was upfront about who he, who he was, what he was all about. Yeah, but, he didn't make any fun. Yeah, but nowadays they cloak it all in populist rhetoric. It's, it's really, really amazing. We'll be back. Dan Sisson is with us. He is the co uh, the author of the new book, The American Revolution of 1800, uh, which you can find at your favorite bookstore. Stick around. our half-hour book club here at uh, Tom Hartman University, distinguished professor of American history and the revolution coming our way. Dan Sisson on the line with us. He's also an adjunct faculty member at Eastern Washington University, where he teaches the history of technology in the engineering department. And a big tip of the hat to the great, to great folks at EWU for making this uh, Skype connection so clean and so possible. Um, Dan, in, in, in the book, The American Revolution of 1800, in the third chapter, you talk about conspiracy and how this was a a big issue uh, for the particularly the first three administrations, uh, Washington, Adams, and Jefferson. You also talk about corruption. What was the what was the corruption of the day? What was corruption defined as and perceived as? And how does that relate to today? Yeah, and I, I think that corruption was always um, attached to power and influence. And those were in turn attached to uh, avarice or you know, uh, the display of money, the ability to get people to do things by paying them or influencing them. And um, it seems to me that uh, if you look at the, say, the Assumption Bill, which uh, early in our history, the, the first time that uh, an issue of principle appeared between Jefferson and Hamilton, was over the continental securities. I mean, everybody knows that the phrase not worth a continental, they had retired these securities and nobody thought they would be redeemed. And what happened was that Hamilton got a bunch of his friends together who were all wealthy and they went around to the various colonies and they convinced these little old ladies who had these securities in their trunks and these IOUs from the government to turn them over at a fraction of their worth. And Hamilton collected all these and then he established this deal where the federal government would take over the debt. And, of course, all of his friends became extremely wealthy overnight. Well, Jefferson and Madison saw this as a, as a corrupt effort. I mean, you don't this cheat This was people. during the Washington administration? Yeah, this is during the Washington administration. So while he's Secretary of the Treasury, he's doing this. 
That's right. And so this is going to establish that nexus, as he called it, of interest. And Jefferson's uh, description of it was it was a system of administration of government bottomed on corruption. And so when you think about America today and you think about the huge interests like the financiers, the banks in New York, and you say to yourself, well, nobody's gone to jail. Not one person has gone to jail. And, and they got all- bailed out. They got the money yeah. just the same way Alexander Hamilton did. Exactly. And and so you say history is repeating itself. I mean, that is absolutely true. And even now, what we're seeing is uh, the corruption part of it is that the law is avoided. In other words, we no longer enforce the law because no one's gone to jail. And we all know that they've taken two and three hundred million dollars apiece and been flagrant in disrespecting the law. So this is how a republic begins to change into a different form. Of government. Well, and and uh, little little Timmy Geithner has now moved on to a job that's paying very very well. Thank you very much. Um, oh yeah, uh, you Revolve know, the door. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just just like Hamilton did. I mean, he he didn't make his money directly as as uh, Secretary of the Treasury. He made it after the fact. We've gotten maybe a little more sophisticated than Hamilton was about this kind of thing, but. Uh, yeah, we we didn't have the big military establishment with all the subcontractors and the people becoming secretaries and assistant secretaries of defense and all the rest. And then they go in back into government and uh, and supervise the people that they've just been a part of. Right. I mean, this is uh, this is a quandary that we're that we don't know what to do any do about, or if we know what to do about, it, we're simply not doing anything about it. Right, and that's corrupt, really. Yeah, it really is, and uh, so. Conspiracy and Corruption, Chapter 3 of the American History, uh, the, excuse me, The American Revolution of 1800, Dan right. Sisson's new book. It's our, this is our, the Tom Hartman University Book Club. Um, Dan, anything you want to add? We've, we still have three, yeah, four minutes here say, to talk. Anything? One more example of this that sure. I think is really important. It's an example that I think is really important today as we see the struggle between the uh, legislative branch and the executive branch. One of the things that Hamilton tried to do, and Madison and both Jefferson commented on this, was he tried to collapse the separation of powers doctrine by gaining complete control of the legislative branch. And so what we see in the Congress today is the total frustration of the executive branch refusing to even allow appointees uh, to be voted on so that, in a sense, uh, the government has come to a standstill. Uh, we've seen tremendous amounts of blockages. Um, and what we, uh, you know, we're looking at is a government that's paralyzed. And we're not respecting the various ways in which the Constitution says that the government will be carried on and will solve our problems. And so this was a much a part of the 1790s. In fact, it led Jefferson to resign in disgust as Secretary of, of State and go back to Monticello. Um, so, I, yeah. So the, Ham, you said Hamilton when – so we're looking at the George Washington administration mm-hmm. and, and Alexander Hamilton is the Secretary of Treasury, Thomas Jefferson Secretary of State. Jefferson is getting increasingly frustrated by his continual wars with Hamilton and right. Washington increasingly listening to – to Hamilton, and we have just a minute left here, Dan. Um, okay. And 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 I forgot where I was going with that question. Damn. <laughs> well, if you're talking about the government collapsing uh, on itself. Oh no, I, I remember now. I, so you said Hamilton was uh, seized power in the legislative branch. Did it, was he literally just buying legislators the way Absolutely. that? Absolutely, he was on on major issues. He would even write the bills. Uh, so it's like Alec. Thing. He was a one-man Alec. Yeah, that's right. He had a staff of about sixty people, when Jefferson had a staff of only five people, and he had his fingers in everything. Holy! I mean, he, Hamilton. He was one of the most powerful people. In fact, Jefferson comments in the annex that Washington, in the latter couple of years, simply did not have his powers that he once had of uh, being able to make decisions. And Hamilton had stepped in and was just in other words. In other words, George Washington was getting a little senile. And then think of the next administration where Hamilton controls the entire cabinet on every issue under Adams, and Adams has to leave to go to Brain Three because he can't stand the corruption in his own cabinet. That's amazing. It's an absolutely amazing history. This is Chapter Three, the American Revolution of 1800. 
Dan, thanks so much for being with us today. Absolutely, Tom. Great talking with you. You can find the book in any any bookstore anywhere in the anywhere in the country. The American Revolution of eighteen hundred. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. And in fact, over on Amazon, it's number six in elections. It's number 11 in political parties. It's number 14 bestseller in the world in government. 